Hello and welcome to another episode. So today we're going to be discussing about the MCQs that were put up in my Instagram channel. And uh, we had a contest going on to see who gets the prize. So uh, we'll be discussing about those questions and explanations pertaining to that. So in case you are not following that page yet, uh, you can go ahead and check out this account over there in Instagram. Which of the following is termed the reward center? So this is a pretty basic question and the answer is nucleus accumbens. Nucleus ambiguous is uh, related to your vagus. Okay. And uh, nucleus vestigius also known as a vestigial nucleus, which is part of cerebellum. Nucleus acumen, there's nothing called nucleus acumen, just uh, something I put it to just confuse you. And the answer is nucleus accumbens. So when you talk about nucleus accumbens, what you have to understand is something called a ventral tegmental area. When you take a look at your midbrain, so this is a cross section of the midbrain. You can see the tectum, tegmentum, the substantia nigra. So this tegmentum area, okay. So in the from the tegmental area, you can see over here a better picture, and this is the ventral side. So this is the ventral part of the tegmentum. So this is the ventral tegmental area, and you can notice over here the substantia nigra okay so this is the same thing that is given over here so this is the ventral tegmental area now uh, from this ventral tegmental area there are projections that go to parts of the striatum okay so this is the whole striatal structure so if you remember striatum is part of a basal ganglia okay you have the putamen you have the caudate nucleus uh, the globus pallidus and all this in different ways. There's the neostriatum, copper striatum and all that. So basically these structures form your striatum. Okay. And in the striatum, in the ventral part, the ventral striatum is where your nucleus accumbens is. Okay. So this striatal structure that you see over here, um, what you have to understand is in your brain, dorsal and ventral are kind of like this. Okay. So normally you'd Think that uh, dorsal is this behind and uh, ventral is over here but that's not the case okay actually the anatomical position is as if the animal was like this from the side as if the animal is looking like this so imagine a dog okay of some four-legged creature okay so that is the actual position so with regard to that position uh, this would be the ventral and that would be the dorsal Okay, so you can see over here in the ventral part of the striatum, we have the nucleus accumbens, the core of it and the shell of it. So this nucleus accumbens is connected to your ventral tegmental area, which I had discussed previously. Okay, so that is where your dopamine is released and it reaches the nucleus accumbens. And this whole thing is playing a role in the whole reward circuitry because of its close association with all these other structures that are there. Okay, so this is a mesolimbic pathway from the ventral tegmental area to nucleus accumbens. Apart from that, there is also the mesocortical pathways and all that. Finally, this is related to your amygdala, hippocampus, prefrontal cortex, and it affects your motivation, decision making, your reward processing, everything. A lot of things are dependent on this. Okay, so this is the part that is responsible for the whole reward circuitry that is your nucleus accumbens in Hartnup's disease most patients do not experience nutritional deficiency of neutral amino acids because so for this you have to understand a bit about Hartnup's disease and you know if you don't know the concept related to it it would be hard to answer okay so we'll just discuss through that first so First thing about heart pump disease, it is autosomal recessive and there's a problem in absorption of neutral amino acids. So neutral amino acids in particular are affected over here. This could be mutations in this SLC6A19 gene, so the chromosome 5P, um, which is the short arm. And this is the transporter that is most likely affected because of the mutations. So this is involved in the absorption, co-transport sodium and neutral amino acid co-transport okay so this is actually b0 a t1 and it is most commonly seen in the jejunum and proximal convoluted tubules now 
when you talk about heart numbs because of the neutral amino acid deficiency that the most important among that will be a tryptophan and tryptophan is a precursor okay for niacin so because of that what happens is most problems related to a pellagra like disease will be there because of the uh, absence of niacin so skin problems are there first of all and on top of that there will be neurological abnormalities as well okay so skin issues like erythematous scaly uh, lesions in the sun exposed area okay so where sun is exposed that is going to be there neurological can be a lot of things tremors ataxia mood disorder depression convulsion psychosis so neurological and skin also another thing is that tryptophan because uh, it's not absorbed it ends up being in the uh, GIT, passes along and by action by the colonic bacteria that gets converted to indican and this indican further gets absorbed and uh, goes out through the urine and it can be seen as indicanuria okay so through this you can actually get a lot of questions in pathology uh, your biochemistry your medicine okay so uh, this will kind of help you in all of that so this is the concept we are dealing with so basically for absorption of amino acid okay after it's broken down uh, by all the other activities finally when it reaches the intestine uh, it needs to be absorbed so that is through a core transport system sodium along with your amino acid okay and this is a secondary active type of transport but if there is a problem with this there is still other uh, ways by which amino acids can be taken in so even if it's not reaching the final stage of amino acid even before that you know even the di and the tripeptides okay not completely um, split and has not formed amino acid yet but even in that primitive stage there is one transporter okay so this is the uh, PEPT1 okay so this is a peptide one transporter so this kind of acts differently uh, because you can see over here this is coming along with H plus the proton so the other co transporter was actually uh, sodium here what is happening is uh, your sodium potassium ATP is going to set up the currents that are needed and uh, basically based on that your sodium is going to come in H plus is going to go out so that sodium hydrogen exchanger is there so because of that more H H plus outside is now going to result in a influx of H plus along with your dientripe peptides so this is your pept1 transporter so even if there is some sort of abnormality with your uh, normal co-transporter sodium dependent co-transporter of amino acid then these can still manage because this giant tri peptides once they reach inside they are further you know a cytosolic digestion takes place inside and they become amino acids and then they are absorbed later so even if uh, neutral amino acid absorption problems are there they can still be made available through this so in heart nerve disease most often there won't be much issue unless there is some environmental uh, influence as a person goes into a sun exposed area or there is a deficiency in whatever is being taken in on top of what the problem is there so all these will lead to exacerbation but otherwise the person will be normal so please remember that so this is one way by which although there is a problem with absorption of neutral amino acids body still compensates and there is no deficiency as such unless some exacerbating condition is there so the answer for this question is going to be this the presence of peptide transporter one kind of compensates and helps the uptake examples of tyrosine kinase associated receptor activity so for this you have to understand tyrosine kinase intrinsic tyrosine kinase activity and tyrosine kinase associated receptor activity okay so the answer here is going to be your leptin so this is kind of simple intrinsic tyrosine kinase and tyrosine kinase associated activity so when you talk about intrinsic activity of tyrosine kinase there is your insulin and if insulin is there there's also insulin growth factors okay so the insulin growth factor one and, and insulin 
okay because they have a lot of homology in the action and the receptor on which it acts and also growth factors epidermal growth factor platelet derived growth factor vascular endothelial growth factor and many growth factors like that so just to remember you can talk, think about you know insulin and if insulin comes related to that you can think about insulin like growth factors and also since there's a growth factor there think about all the other growth factors so in a way you basically found a way to remember all of these okay so they all have intrinsic tyrosine kinase activity tyrosine kinase associated are these other ones okay so think of at least one one of these it's easier to remember these anything that is not this is tyrosine kinase associated so we have your leptin which is very important erythropoietin and growth hormone along with prolactin and also your cytokines okay so growth hormone prolactin and leptin erythropoietin with your cytokines these are tyrosine kinase associated so you can see over here this is the uh, receptor with an intrinsic tyrosine kinase domain so a part of the receptor is a intrinsic tyrosine kinase domain so basically what tyrosine kinase does is it phosphorylates your tyrosine domain you can see this this does not have an intrinsic system like this within itself there is no tyrosine kinase activity but associate to it next to it there's another peripheral uh, protein which is there which is jack janus kinase and janus kinase that kind of has tyros tyrosine kinase activity which will help phosphorylate some tyrosine residue here and that will again activate other things and there will be linkage with something called a stat so jack stat and further things happen okay so this is your tyrosine kinase domain that we are talking about and this is the janus kinase which is associated with it and in one of the options if you had remember there was tgf beta so that tgf beta is actually your serine or threonine kinase so here we were talking about tyrosine kinase activity instead if a kinase a phosphorylation of serine or threonine residue happen that is serine threonine kinase activity and one example for that is your tgf beta so you can see over here the difference so there's a janus kinase that will help phosphorylate it that will activate stat and that is the jack stat signal pathway and it goes and activates the transcription translation processes so this is how cytokine is acting this is associated tyrosine kinase associated and intrinsic receptor tyrosine kinase activity you can see that this itself has a tyrosine kinase activity which will phosphorylate it which will in turn activate a lot of things okay so this is we were talking about growth factors okay so this is an important mechanism for growth factor effector mechanisms in the body okay by stratified ganglion cells carry information about this again if you know it you know it otherwise you won't know it the answer here is going to be blue wavelength so when you talk about color vision we have the cones which are there and the cones different wavelengths uh, special specialized cones are there one for the small wavelength medium wavelength long wavelength okay uh, so that is the color that you actually see over here so this is the blue the around the green range and this is around the yellow range which can also detect over the side of that wavelength red color okay uh, so we're talking about blue color so the blue color what you have to understand is from the cones the next stop is your bipolar cells and from the bipolar cells the next stop is your ganglion cells okay so the whatever visual impulse is coming from this which is blue color that goes to your blue on so bipolar cells arrangement is such that there's on cell and off cell on cell and off cell it's kind of like that so this bipolar the, at the center there's a blue on so if that central blue on is activated that means blue color is there it's detecting a blue color okay and basically what it detects is your blue minus your green and uh, your yellow so this is kind of what it detects so what happens is it takes the impulses from your medium wavelength and long wavelength cones okay so that becomes what is called the luminance pathway and that subtracted from your 
a uh, small wavelength whatever is there so that kind of activates your blue on center okay and outside it is the off center that is your uh, again this the luminance pathway that you see over okay so this kind of gives a blue and yellow contrast okay i know this is kind of little difficult uh so we have a blue color so cones which are small wavelength and that takes a difference between this and the luminance pathway which is taken from the sum of both this and that will activate the blue on and around it will be off so for example if blue is not there and these are what are majorly there then this this off pathway those ones are activated not the central ones but if blue is there the central ones are activated so if that is activated and this is relatively not active then it goes to the next step okay so that is where your blue yellow bistratified ganglion is there so these ganglions are specific for taking signals from this blue on center okay so that was a question okay bistratified ganglion is for which specifically it is for your blue wavelength of color okay and from there it goes to your lateral geniculate body so from the ganglion cell it's going to form the optic nerve optic chiasma optic tract and it's going to reach the lateral geniculate body and in the lateral geniculate body there is one particular area called the corneocellular pathway which is quite different from the other colors and you know other things that you see so this particular part corneocellular part of the lateral geniculate body is again for this and finally you know it goes to the cortex and in the cortex it goes to layer 2 and 3 please remember that because otherwise normally all the things go to 4c okay when you talk about your color vision vision in general it goes to layer 4 but this whatever is coming from this blue color is coming in layer 2 3 of the cortex so when you talk about the blue pathway lot of things are different okay like first thing is this the blue on blue off bipolar then it goes to blue yellow bistratified ganglion then it goes to corneocellular lateral geniculate body and then goes to layer 2 and 3 of the cortex okay so that is why it's called bistratified corneocellular pathway and you can see over here uh, the other pathway that is your red and green Okay, so that is what is called the midjet power cellula. So this again provides some contrast difference. So always these are opponent colors, blue and yellow, and your red and green. Okay, so blue and yellow and red and green. Please remember that. So these are like uh, opposing colors. Assembly protein one clathrin code is for transporting from. So the answer here is Golgi to the lysosome. so this is where you have to understand a lot of uh, core protein and assembly protein and how they act so we we have the nucleus and we have the endoplasmic reticulum we have the golgi apparatus this is the uh, cell membrane and you can consider this to be a lysosome so for trafficking between various things there is need for some core protein so clathrin mediated transport there is need for some core proteins which are there which are associated to help it okay so basically for endocytosis the endocytos vesicle going and finally it has to go and dock in the golgi apparatus for this whole thing you need the assembly protein 2 okay so the assembly protein 2 is for this okay uh, and also from your golgi apparatus whatever uh, is coming out okay maybe a vesicle through a vesicle is going to come out and finally reach the lysosome for digestion and all that that sort of transport is through assembly protein 1 so basically the endocytosed uh, vesicle going and docking in your golgi apparatus that is assembly protein 2 and from the golgi apparatus to the lysosome that is assembly protein 1 and between the endoplasmic reticulum and the golgi are the coat proteins okay so the cotum of proteins 1 and 2 so from golgi to endoplasmic reticulum is your core protein 1 and from endoplasmic reticulum to your golgi apparatus is core protein 2 
true statement about carbohydrate absorption in GIT. Okay, so before we go to this, we just discuss about the basic concept related to it and then we'll try to figure out the answer. So first thing is for absorption of your carbohydrate. Okay, uh, so this is the apical and this is the basolateral segment. So your basic glucose, galactose, lactose, for them to be absorbed, you need a sodium glucose transporter. And in the GIT, it is sodium glucose transporter 1. Okay, when you talk about your nephron, uh, the most important one is sodium glucose transporter 2. Also know that 1 is also there but only 10 percentage. Majority is SGLT2. Okay, in the intestine, SGLT1 is more important and glucose, galactose, lactose from the apical segment go through SGLT1. Okay, fructose on the other hand goes in through GLUT5. Okay, so now glucose, galactose, lactose has reached inside through SGLT1 and for it to be reabsorbed into the circulation through GLUT2, it is absorbed. In a similar way, fructose, once fructose is inside through GLUT5, it can either get converted to glucose and then follow this pathway or fructose by itself can be absorbed through GLUT2. Also remember this concept. So, so sodium glucose transporter 1 is secondary active. Okay, it's a secondary active co-transporter. GLUT5 on the other hand, is facilitated. So over here sodium is coming in along with it. So this is a facilitated division of fructose through GLUT5 and also even GLUT2 in the basal lateral segment that is also a facilitated type of diffusion. So now that that is clear we will try to answer this. Galactose is absorbed via SGLT1 that is true. Okay. But in the basal lateral segment it is through GLUT2 not GLUT4. So that is wrong. Glucose is absorbed via GLUT5, so that is wrong. It's not 5-GLUT5. Glucose is through SGLT1. And GLUT2 plays a role in basolateral, so that is true. Fructose is absorbed via GLUT5, that is true. And in the basolateral segment, GLUT2 plays a role, that is also true. So that is going to be our answer. Okay, so we'll just look at the last option. Glucose is absorbed via secondary active transport, that is true. And basolateral primary active, no. Basolateral is facilitated diffusion. So that is the wrong statement. Okay, so this is the answer. Fill the answer for the box with a question mark. So this is uh, the whole idea of how motor activity happens. The first idea of this starts in the cortical association area. It planning takes place with the help of basal ganglia and the lateral cerebellum. And that is the neocerebellum. And it goes to the premotor and motor cortex where movement is executed. But you see something else over here. So that is like movement is executed and some sort of feedback is there and it can correct it. Okay, so this is something else in intermediate that is acting, which kind of uh, gets the feedback and changes things. Okay, so the answer for that is going to be your intermediate cerebellum. Okay, so basal ganglia is for planning and programming. Lateral cerebellum is a new cerebellum, which again is for planning. So all the both of these are before this. The vestibular apparatus is for very primitive movements and reflexes. Okay, based on impulses that come to your vestibular uh, apparatus, that is taking it and immediately resulting in some reflex. It's not going, you know, all the way to the uh, cortex. Okay, even before that, it can mediate a lot of things with the help of cerebellum again. So over there also your cerebellum is involved, okay, especially the vestibular cerebellum. So the answer here is your intermediate cerebellum. We'll try to see what is there. So the cerebellum is uh, split into different parts. This is the vestibular cerebellum over here. This is the uh, spinal cerebellum over here. So this vestibular cerebellum is the most primitive one called the archicerebellum. Spinal cerebellum is the intermediate one called the paleocerebellum and cerebrocerebellum is the lateral hemisphere which is neocerebellum. So you can see here this is the hemisphere. In the hemisphere the lateral part of this is the lateral hemisphere and this is the middle part the intermediate part. Okay so over here in the center there's vermis and this is the intermediate domain. Okay so this is the lateral hemisphere, this is the intermediate, this is the vermis, this is the vestibulocerebellum. Okay, so neocerebellum planning programming, vestibulocerebellum primitive 
reflex to maintain balance and the eye movement based on your impulses coming from vestibular apparatus okay but apart from that your spinocerebellum is what controls tone stretch reflex through your uh, medial and lateral descending system so if you remember the vermis in the center uh, that has relation to your medial descending system and your intermediate zone has relation to lateral descending so basically your proximal as well as the distal muscles are uh, controlled through this okay so they get feedback through the spinocerebellar tract and they in turn help modulate things okay so one branch of the motor copy is given here with, with which it compares everything and then corrects everything based on that so this spinocerebellum or the intermediate part of the paleocerebellum is responsible for such corrections